Good evening, everyone. Welcome to day five. Well, the evening of day five of the Department of Dreams Re Festival. Um, and guys, we've got like an evening for you here. Okay, so whatever you're doing, go like put your laptop or your phone or whatever in a evening, safe everyone. place. Make yourself Welcome a cup of tea. Five. Try well, and get your kids or everyone to like sit down and like concentrate because you're about to have your mind blown for the next two and a half hours. First up, we've got and and you're you're going to be hosted for the next two and a half hours by the wonderful Ali Asina, who is one of the associate curators on the um, on yeah. the festival and has been putting together some really beautiful beautiful things. So welcome. What's happening tonight then? Right. First up, we've got the most brilliant. Priya Vada Gopal, um, and Priya is happy to be called Priya for short um, because I've asked her this before as well. Um, so Priya is a university reader in Anglophone and related literatures in the Faculty of English and Fellow of Churchill College, University of Cambridge. You can find her on Twitter as Priya Vada Gopal, and I'm going to talk to you a little bit about the theme of the of the conversation shortly. But before that, because she hasn't really done it that much, right, I'm going to introduce the brilliant Alia Asana. She has been involved in uh, curating some of the festival, but I've been really lucky to know Alia for um, lots of years and also her reminding me that I feel old now because I both feel like a friend and a bit of an auntie. But Alia um, is just one of the most uh, beautiful radical souls um, that I've ever come across and she's definitely going to just change everything in this place so uh follow her and support her and i'm not gonna um actually uh, ex describe her in um an academic way i'm gonna describe her from her website because if you read this first bit right it'll make you go to the website have a look around her website and you will come across some stuff that will send you like off the table right because it is so some of it is so brilliantly put together um so my name is alia I'm a curator, writer, and filmmaker whose work focuses on decolonial approaches to history and the present day. I curate exhibitions, produce events, festivals, creative strategies, consult on campaigns and projects as well as making films and writing poetry scripts and shit captions. I also facilitate in public and publicly speak, basically, if I enjoy it. And, and she'll go on like and say loads of brilliant stuff um, in that bio. But then she finishes with saying, it's important to me that love and care are at the center of my practice so we can envision and awake new possibilities for ourselves and others. I believe that what, that's where the true innovation lies. This sometimes mean hard, means hard conversations are had, but having them enriches the work and understanding further. I will always speak my mind as I have no business speaking everyone else's minds. And then she goes on to, to tell you a bit more about her. But have a go and have a look on Alia's website. <laughs> Hire her, listen to her, pay her. And um, yeah, and it, your life will be a lot better because basically that's been my whole life with her. Uh, and and she just first, curates the best work. Um, the so one. moving on into the session, uh, which Alia is going to beautifully uh, look after with Priya. I'm just going to tell you a little bit about the name of the session. So it's Insurgent Empire. And it's focused on the book that Priya released last year. And we were very lucky to have Priya at the hub for those of you who are in Birmingham before we closed back in October. And I just felt like when we were putting this festival together, we only got like a glimpse of that book and the potential of it. And weirdly, the world's changed in some ways so much in the last nine months. And I felt like some of the, well everything in there's always relevant but some of it became even more relevant to now and I just wanted to bring this conversation up and take it a bit further basically and also hear Priya's voice reading and just hear more about the book right because it's quite a chunk so there's no way we got through it all during that hub hub event and if it's the first time you've come to this like you want to settle into this I'm telling you that now so Insurgent Empire shows how Britain's enslaved and colonial subjects were active agents in their own liberation I'm going to say that again Insurgent Empire shows how Britain's enslaved and colonial subjects were active agents in their own liberation. And that's why we've invited Priya today to the Department of Dreams. What is more, they shaped British ideas of freedom and emancipation back in the United Kingdom. Priya Vada Gopal exam examines a century of dissent on the question of empire and shows how British critics of empire were influenced by rebellions and resistance in the colonies. From the West Indies and East Africa, to Egypt and India. In addition, a pivotal role in ferment fermenting resistance was played by anti-colonial campaigners based in London, right in the heart of empire. 
Much has been written on how colonized peoples took up Britain and U British and European ideas and turned them against empire when making claims to freedom and self-determination. Insurgent empire sets the record straight in demonstrating that these, that these people were much more than victims of imperialism or subsequently the passive beneficiaries of an enlightened British conscience. They were insurgents whose legacies shaped and benefited the nation that once oppressed them. I think there's something really powerful in this. I don't think I need to describe why, given the five days that we've already had. The book and the conversation will speak for itself. So I'm very happily moving into the backstage now. I'm going to hand over to Ilya and Priya. Enjoy, and I hope everybody in the audience enjoys too. Thank you so much for that introduction, Imi. That's the first time someone's read my bio off of my website, and it's in first person, so I was like, oh! But um, thank you so much for joining us today, Priya. I'm really, really excited to um get into this conversation and just feel a lot of warmth around the work you've been doing um around showing that you know, this liberation has always been us who have initiated it instead of um a lot of it being whitewashed which we'll get onto a little bit later um but before we get into that how are you doing today how are you Hi, yes, hi, Alia, um, and everyone who's listening. Uh, thank you for having this conversation with me. Uh, thank you for doing this. So I want to say thank you to Imi, Nikki, and their team. Uh, this is such a great festival, and I'm delighted to hear it's gone so well. Um, I'm well. Uh, like everyone else, I've been trying to make sense of the present and trying to make sense of the kinds of things we're hearing uh, around us and some of the kind of frankly bonkers ideas that are issuing from the heart of government uh, in this country today, particularly in relation to slavery and empire. Um, for me, in some ways, you know, I, I wrote this book uh, well over a year ago, and, and in some ways the work is behind me, but listening to what's been going on in this country the last few weeks, uh, I am struck by how much we have to learn from the people I write about, uh, people who were active in resisting slavery and colonialism in the past. So, yeah. And yeah. I think that's been one of my biggest, not just concerns, but learnings of this um, period of unravelling um, or enlightening or whatever we want to call um, resistance, like what is currently happening, is that I've been so deeply motivated by this work, probably since the age of seven, um and so learning about all those histories that we called alternative histories or um histories of resistance is something that i think for both of us has been something that we've looked into with quite with a lot of detail and nuance and so to see all of this happening and just the sheer lack of information that is whether it's in the school curriculum or being circulated online with regards to what is happening it's just been one of the most shocking wake-up calls of i i've been in my little bubble i've been in a bubble of understanding these things um and so i guess my first question i just wanted to ask how how has that felt to see um the lack of not only access to this information for the majority of our communities in the uk and globally but just that this this idea that those who have been oppressed have always been the rebels um and those who led the revolutions is completely erased at some level it's not surprising i mean one of the things i think i've realized over the last decade and a half of engaging with uh, empire and imperial kind of engagement in this country is how much is deliberate right mm -hmm. so it's not as though uh it is unknown that empire was resisted or that slaves rebelled from the moment that they were captured and put on a ship. Uh, the historical record is very clear that the colonized and the enslaved constantly rebelled. So it's not as though if you stand up and you say, well, you know, here are the, here are the, uh, the rebels, um, power will turn around and say, oh, okay, sorry, we'll put them back in the historical record. What I realize now is that there is a willful, sanctioned, deliberate, and planned ignorance mm. around resistance, right? Because power cannot concede that mm. there is resistance. 
it gains its legitimacy from pretending that there isn't resistance. Mm. So when you have Tory MPs say things like, well, you know, decolonization and emancipation happened because Britain decided to free the slaves and free the colonized, mm. um, you realize that this has been repeated. Uh, he is at the end of a very long line of people who've been saying this from the moment that slavery and colonization were undertaken mm. by Britain. And so, you know, it's part of a very long tradition of British myth-making. Mm. And what is extremely tragic is that um, ordinary Britons, ordinary, you know, especially young people uh, who are not necessarily invested in that power hierarchy, who are not necessarily invested uh, in praising empire or praising uh, slavery, um, are denied their own history. And I don't mean just, uh, you know, black or Asian or minority ethnic uh, uh, young British people, but also white British people. Mm. They have been deprived of their own history. And that's one of the reasons I set out to write this book, not because I think it's going to change what power does, uh, but because I think that we have to keep saying these are the facts, this is the reality, and for those who seek it, we correct the historical record. And that's that, in a sense, is what I'm seeing kind of playing out all over again. And if I can just say one small thing, I begin um, with a person who I think we should all familiarize ourselves with much, much more, and that is the freed slave and abolitionist Frederick Douglass. Mm -hmm. Frederick Douglass is an in incredibly important person for us because he is the one who, uh, you know, in uh, 1857, when the abolition of slavery in 1838 was being commemorated, uh, you know, he, he thanked the abolitionists, he thanked England, but he said, you know, let us remember that a fall, a share of the credit for emancipation falls justly to the slaves themselves. And that to the a extent that they were able to, they resisted and fought for their own freedom. And remember, this fight was under horrendous conditions, you know, mm -hmm. where you were at the end of a whip or a gun all the time. You were literally in chains. So to resist in those conditions was, uh, you know, probably unimaginable, uh, even for those of us who think about resistance and, and, and participate in, uh, in it. So Frederick Douglass is important because he, you know, he said, and I begin with this quote, which I'll read out. He says, the whole history of the progress of human liberty shows that all concessions yet made to her august claims have been born of earnest struggle. Power mm -hmm. can nothing without a demand. It never did and never will. And this is something I think our government would like us to forget, that any concession that they have given us, any concession that we have won, any rights that we have, we won them and our ancestors won them. They were not given out of the kindliness mm -hmm. of the hearts of the elite. Oh, 100%. Uh, and thank you so much for um, breaking that down in that way. That absolutely, there's an intentionality with the way that this is playing out. It's like we see today within the media, it's all story telling. It's all, how do we craft our narrative to suit ourselves? It didn't come because the empire started to care about these people, or even humanize them. It came because not only um, was it no longer economically sustainable because of the Haitian revolution and um, how that had like completely that like struck fear into so many of the slave owning um, elite when we're talking about the colonized people in the Caribbean and so on. But um, I think what's so interesting, something that you picked up is the narrative spinning of decolonization being a passive, not just a passive process, but also one that is historical, as opposed to it being something that is also current and active and a continual process after 500 years of colonization. Um, and a friend of mine, Imani Robertson, incredible curator, um, looking into forensic um, archaeology at the moment, who was inspired to do that work because of Grenfell. Everyone, please go look up Imani Robertson. Um, but her work looks into decoloniality, and she once said um, decoloniality is a series of ruptures. It can't just be 
or one process and then we're done. It's that continual rupturing um, moment by moment, day by day. And I think what we're seeing in the world right now is one of those big ruptures. Um, and I know historically your book speaks about this in a variety of different ways from across multiple um, empires. And I just wanted to invite you in this moment to share some of um, the book now and give us a little reading before we dig into some more of what needs to be said. Okay, um, let me just read uh, a little bit from the beginning and then a little bit from the end, which uh, speaks to what, um, what you were saying just now. Okay. Well over the century and a half since Douglas gave that speech, which I just referred to, the notion that freedom from both slavery and imperial rule emerged thanks to the benevolence of the rulers continues to exercise a tenacious hold both within influential strands of British imperial history and in the popular imagination. Both abolition and decolonization, twin outcomes of Britain's expansionary colonial project over three centuries, are all too frequently regarded as deriving chiefly from the campaigning consciences of white British reformers or as the logical outcome of the liberal and liberalizing project that empire ostensibly always was, conquering in order to free. Despite an abundance of histories of resistance, and not only from a nationalist perspective, which make clear the constitutive role of resistance to the imperial project, imperial initiative, colonies given their freedom when they were deemed ready for it, as the motive force for decolonization remain, remains stubbornly entrenched in much political and public discourse in Britain. Um, and we saw this, uh, I forget the name of the Tory MP who, who tweeted a couple of days ago saying, you know, decolonization was largely peaceful. Uh, Britain decided to give uh, freedom to the enslaved and, and, and the, and the uh, formerly colonized. I mean, this is completely untrue. It's, a, it's an outright lie. There was nothing peaceful about decolonization. The entire history of both slavery and colonization, which are intimately uh, related, uh, is a series of rebellions. It's a series of wars. And it was a deeply bloody project with a very high body count. Um, and so what we have now is a situation where, again, we are simply being lied to by people in power. Um, mm -hmm. So, you know, the British people are of all colors, of all ethnicities, are being told that decolonization and uh, uh, abolition were free of conflict and violence. And that is quite simply untrue. And that's what I uh, begin the book by, by saying to speak to one of those stories so my family heritage part of it is in Barbados and quite often when we're trying when that space and that island was used almost as like a um example for how to enact the colonial projects if we look at the like Barbados slave laws of like 1831 there's this the, the intentionality is so very specific but um with regards to what you were saying of us being pitted against the um the white disenfranchised communities, very seldom do we hear the story of them actually being used because of that same thing in the colonial project as well. And the intentionality behind creating not only a colorism spectrum, but um, a workforce that was able to create um, a very specific um, colorist structure in the Caribbean and Brazil and so on. So the Irish, um, and a lot of like white working class people being taken over as indentured servants, not enslaved, again, to reinforce that racial hierarchy of them being um, better because of the color of their skin, but also to um, create communities with those who were enslaved so that they could build um, that racial casting system. And so to then have a complete detachment from that usury because they weren't people who were considered human either um and see how we're pitted to, against each other in the current day is just genuinely astounding to me but again yeah. like you're saying it's so intentional yeah yeah um one of the things i look at um in the book as a whole 
uh, is the ways in which British anti-colonialists, uh, white as well as uh, uh, of other races, um, constantly appealed to the British working classes to understand that the same people who were oppressing them here were also oppressing black and brown people outside Britain mm. in the colonies. And so uh, there was, you know, there's a long history uh, of trying uh, to get people to understand that uh, divide and rule is being used and that that divide mm. and rule is profoundly racialized and that, ex that exploitation uh, is uh, happens across color lines, but people are prevented from seeing the commonalities because of this racial hierarchy. And, and in a way, it's kind of depressing um, to see Claude Mackay in 1919s uh, writing to the, uh, addressing the white working classes and saying, listen, instead of taking out your anger on uh, the Chinese and the Asian seamen and the Lascars on the docks, there were riots in, in 1919, racial riots. Mm -hmm. I was just gonna say, in the midst of a pandemic, that's probably the last time we saw the riots today. At the end of the war, yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. and, and he was saying, why don't you just focus on the people who are causing the unemployment, who are causing uh, your oppression, uh, instead of you know racializing your rage? And I was just struck by how absolutely spot on it, it is in with relation to what happened around Brexit um, and the kind of channeling of rage away from the exploiting classes towards immigrants. Um, and you think, my God, you know, it's the same discussion again. Um, and, and you know, I don't know. On the one hand, it's inspiring. On the other hand, it's depressing that, that we haven't been able to make this point with sufficient force. And the same skin doctors, but I think it, it absolutely is woefully depressing. But I think one of the things that gives me hope within it is that if we look at, like, the right, race rights that happened in 1919 in England, um, because of like the semen and all of those um, things that were happening then. And then we look at even today with how Black Lives Matter has erupted in the last couple of weeks in the midst of a pandemic. Not mm -hmm. only is it a learning and a history that we can look at to say that actually there have been race riots before or there have been racialized protests and things before in the midst of a pandemic. It feels quite eerie, but it also feels like there are some lessons that we can learn and apply to where we're currently at. Yeah, yeah. I mean, one, uh, you know, I said it's depressing, but I think one important thing is that in the 20s and 30s, there were also attempts, which we are seeing mm -hmm. uh, repeated today, to form transnational and cross-racial coalitions um, of people who are saying, you know, we can make common cause even while understanding that we have very different experiences that mm. you know to be black and working class uh, is a very specific kind of history which is different from being english white and working class but nonetheless we can not only aid and support each other's struggles we can make common cause um and i i, I think that's what i would hope we can kind of hark back to at this moment the the fact that racism is now being understood on the one hand as a specifically of an issue of black lives and, and state violence against black people, but also as something that other people can't stand away from because it concerns mm -hmm. us all. Um, mm -hmm. And I think that that is the common thread that I, I would want to draw from, from the episodes I look at in the book to the present day. In the book, there's also a chapter on the Mau Mau. And yes. so this was something that was very much erased from my history books, as I'm sure it was with many others, because we seldom learn um, colonial history at school. I think I just had one lesson that was one episode of Roots, and that was it. That, that was literally it for Black History Month and the Black History Curriculum. Um, and that was like 2014, 2013. So That's terrifying. Quite recently, I'm only 23. And so it's yeah it's not it hasn't even changed in my younger sister's time um but when i learned about the mau mau i was curating an exhibition um, at birmingham museum and art gallery called the past is now and we were looking mm. at the relationship that birmingham in particular as a city had um with the colonial effort so it being used as a manufacturing hub and guns being made in the gun quarter being sold for black women's bodies to like um sell into the slave trade and the fact that they, like the formation of canals was to get them to the ports like Bristol to then be shipped off. So even in like the city making and the infrastructure across um, the country, there's it, it was all geared up 
for this process of colonization. It was almost as rallying the whole country, the working class people in factories yeah. to um, get them on side to be part of that colonial effort. But it was also the first time that I came across the um, Mau Mau um, rebellion. And even the fact that we call it the Mau Mau rebellion when yeah. that wasn't the name of the um, tribes who enacted it, but again, like a colonial term that was placed on them that we now just use because there were so many different um, groups that were part of that that we didn't have specific names for because of, again, colonial storytelling. But I just wondered if you could tell us a little bit more about that episode and that insurgency and some of the lessons that may have been learned. Um, okay, well, the first thing to say is that the movement that was referred to as Mau Mau was, in fact, the insurgency enacted by uh, what an organization or a movement that called itself the Land and Freedom Army. Mm -hmm. And you can see the difference in name, you know, Mau Mau gives it that sense of this kind of weird, exotic, possibly slightly barbaric, uh, 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 violent movement happening in the jungles, which is exactly how it was presented mm. in Britain. Whereas land and freedom very clearly lays out exactly what the goals of the movement were. Um, so we don't hear about uh, land and freedom. It, it, it's a long uh, movement. It uh, begins in one sense, the, the lead up to it is in the 1940s. Um, what is happening in Kenya in, in large parts of what was then known as the East Africa Protectorate um, is that essentially uh, the peoples who traditionally used that land were pushed off it, corralled into uh, small reservations, but were also then required to work the land. And what you then had was uh, large groups of, if you like, indigenous uh, people uh, and, uh, and communities who were uh, made to uh, live in these kind of small uh, concentrated areas while white settlers took, took over large chunks of land mm -hmm. and farmed profitably using the labor of the same people who they had um, uh, corralled to, uh, to small uh, parts of land. And eventually, I mean, there were lots of reasons for the uprising, but eventually, including kind of racial humiliation, uh, very similar to South Africa, uh, you know, in order to move from one part to another, uh, black Kenyans had to carry little passbooks called Kipandi. Um, there was a, a huge amount of uh, violence enacted upon them, uh, labor extracted under, you know, near, near slavery conditions, um, uh, great impoverishment. So, um, plus, of course, uh, 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 in a sense, cultural humiliation of, of different kinds. Um, so without going into kind of long history of, of that movement, which would really require a separate lecture, I, I would say that um, basically when the movement turned to its violent form in the form of guerrilla warfare, in the form of forest uh, warfare, um, that's when uh, it became known as the Mau Mau movement. And mm -hmm. what it met with was a vicious uh Counter insurgency uh, with the declaration of an emergency in the early 1950s. And it, it is famously a very brutal counter insurgency. And that is when uh, thousands of Kenyans, whether they were part of the movement or not, were rounded up and put into internment camps, uh, into detention camps, and tortured and treated with horrific cruelty. Mm. The important thing, and this is the, I mean, I don't talk about the Mau Mau movement uh, per se, but I talk about how the counterinsurgency was then received back in Britain. On the one hand, of course, the tabloids went nuts in, in, the, in all the ways that you might imagine they went nuts, right? So the stories were all about kind of barbaric Africans enacting violence upon or innocent white children. And yes, there was, uh, you know, there was horrific violence, uh, uh, mm. as you would expect with a, a forest uh, a guerrilla insurgency, but there was also tremendous violence uh, on the part of the colonizer, both in the years that led up to it, but also in the form of the emergency and the, and the counterinsurgency 
inflicted mm-hmm. by the colonial state. Um, but of course, the the British press focused largely on uh, the horror stories of atrocities enacted against whites. But there were people in Britain uh, who started asking questions about what was being done mm. in East Africa in the name of Britain. And one of the things uh, that I talk about there is that the Mirror newspaper actually sent the MP, the Labour MP, Barbara Castle, uh, to uh, what is present day Kenya to uh, investigate what was going on uh, in the name of Britain in the colonies. And she writes a series of very hard hitting reports. And another Labour MP by the name of Fenna Brockway. Um, also, he and others spent time in Kenya, try to get to know uh, what is going on, try to get to understand the perspective of Kenyan anti-colonialists. Um, you have the Kenyan Tom Maboya, who comes and spends a year in Britain in Oxford, and he becomes a kind of voice uh, for Kenyan nationalism in Britain. So I talk about the ways both in which There was tremendous um, kind of antipathy towards uh, uh, East Africa and the rebels, but there was also solidarity. Um, And there was also, it was a minority strand for sure. Mm -hmm. Uh, You imagine that the usual tabloids did the usual thing, but there was also the mirror and there were also uh, labor MPs who uh, stood up and said, actually what we're doing in Kenya is wrong. Mm. Um, and we are responsible for a great deal of oppression and bloodshed, and this should not be taking place. So I'm, I'm, I'm going to try to draw out two things, the strand of colonial oppression, but also the strand of dissent in Britain, which grows because there is an attempt to understand, engage with, and build solidarities with uh, Kenyan anti-colonialists and Kenyan insurgents. Mm, and I think that point of the dissent or how like it had started to build solidarity movements in this country is so important mm. to mm. just bring into the conversation when we constantly um, are hearing conversations that, oh, actually, it was way back then. They didn't know. We, we're not in this same society now, so yeah. we can't hold them to those same standards. But to know that there have always been people who knew this was wrong because we're like... They, humans know when you're doing something wrong you feel it in your gut you decide whether you listen to that or you feed your ego and feed like power and control and all of those things that we saw really be exercised um and fear above all as part of the colonial project um but i think it's it's just so it's so refreshing to hear you bring that up in and also in conjunction with um a lot of the discourse we hear around like the enlightenment period and how um the uk had given had abolished slavery and that's why it ended and i just wanted to ask you like with those two things what do you think are some of the most pressing connections that we can um bring into movement building today from that learning of insurgent groups in the uk yeah, thank you. That that's a great question. Uh, you know, uh, 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 listening to all these um, debates over the last couple of weeks, if we can call them debates, um, uh, is you know this repeated claim, and you, we've heard it over and over again when when Edward Col- Colston's statue was pulled mm-hmm. down, there were protests around the road statue. How dare you judge the past by present day standards? And honestly, uh, if there was one thing that I wanted this book to do, it was to tell young British people, this is bullshit. This is absolutely bullshit that back in the day, everybody thought slavery wasn't a big deal or back in the day, everybody was okay with the empire. This is again, another fib, it's a lie. Um, And, you know, we hear this coming not from right wing quarters, we hear this coming from perfectly liberal Mm -hmm. journalists and academics that, oh, well, you know, you mustn't judge the past by today's standards. One thing the book shows is that there is no such thing. The past was no more homogeneous and agreed on everything than we are. Can you imagine if 200 years down the line, people looked at the 21st century and said, oh, back in the 21st century, everybody thought this. Mm. Uh, such a ludicrous thing to say, and it's an equally ludicrous thing to say about the 18th 
uh, century. So one thing I would say is that let's not buy that line. Uh, but what lessons can we learn for organizing? Well, two things. One, yes, as you said, Alia, uh, there is a human tendency to understand that uh, uh, you know things are wrong, uh, uh, that that certain things shouldn't be done uh, in our name uh, or by us. But equally, I think, and this is the other point I tried to make in the book, um, human beings ha have the capacity to learn from each other. Mm. So what we have in Britain is that British anti-colonialists and British critics of empire constantly learned from insurgencies and rebellions happening in other parts of the world. They consciously engaged with people in Egypt, with Muslims, with Hindus, with uh, former slaves, with people in Kenya, and they consciously tried to learn. So the whole process is one of human beings creating alliances by consciously setting out to learn from each other. And I think that that is the one lesson that we can take from the alliances of those days and the critics and campaigners and organizers of those days that will serve us well uh, in the present. Amazing, thank you so much for that. And um, I think we've got a question around roads must fall. And um, yeah. let me just pull it up. We've got some comments saying partition of India was very violent, not a peaceful, nothing peaceful about it at all. And then we've got a question. Um, Mau Mau history is still erased and distorted here in Kenya. Um, threatens the ruling classes who took over after decolonization. That's a comment, not a question, my bad. Um, but I did also wanna just draw a line between the process of it getting to the Mau Mau rebellion and the Edward Colston statute coming down. And so, as you said, there were um, conversations around like land justice and that being the initial ask that wasn't what then became the Mau Mau Rebellion. It sort of led into that through the lack of listening to those people for so long. And so when we look at the Edward Colston um, statue being toppled, for example, some of the backlash we've seen around that, there's a complete ignoring of the fact that like hundreds of people, thousands of people have petitioned this for years and been ignored by their city council. Um, and so when we then get these sensationalist headlines, there's just a complete lack of due diligence when it comes to what was the holistic context and what had come to result in this. We just see the result and then we and then we brand it as brutal or violent and so on and so forth. Can I just come in on, on, the, on the ones that you've mentioned so far? Uh, because I think actually the comment about Kenya and the ways in which Mau Mau is used in Kenya and the comment about partition Mm. are important. Here's the thing. I think that often the two conversations are often kept separate, which is the question of British imperialism and British racism and what happened under colonialism and the question of what happens in post-colonial nation state. The partition is a very good example of, on the one hand, it is clearly, clearly the fault of the hurried and callous manner in which both Britain did divide and rule and left the subcontinent in a hurry. But it, when we talk about decolonization, we also as post-colonial subjects and as BME have to look at what has gone wrong and what went wrong in our own communities and societies. Partition is a very good example of one hand, very clear uh, colonial, of responsibility, but it is also true that Hindus, Muslims, and Sikhs butchered each other. And when we look back at that painful moment, we also have to ask very tough questions about our own communities and our own forgetting and our own amnesia, as in the case of Kenya and Kenyatta and the erasing of a, of a, of a certain uh, Kenyan history in favor of a nationalist story you have mm -hmm. Uh, bullshit nationalist stories in, in, in India and Pakistan as well. So the more, I always say this, the minute we hold the colonizer to account, which we must, we must also hold ourselves to account and the two things are not separate. Thank you so much for bringing that level of complexity and nuance into the conversation. I do think that's something that we do often ignore that 
we have to start by unpacking I guess, essentially power and how power can corrupt and how power changes. And yeah. we had a conversation earlier with Suzanne Elien, who's looking at the neurology of power and how when people gain power, they're less likely to be empathetic. And so what does that look like to purposefully move forward with that understanding, but our understanding of power and it being tied to coloniality and the undoing of that being part of the decolonization process as well. Um, we have a question from Annika who says, what are the steps we need to take as a movement? Um, campaigns like fill in the blanks, black curriculum, etc., cetera, the, um, the Free Black Uni, um, to get this history taught to children in the UK? Well, you know, great question. And I am delighted to see that young people are running these uh, campaigns, fill in the black, why is my curriculum white, uh, black curriculum, uh, and so on. I think I think these are the, the right steps. But I will point out uh, uh, something that Alia said earlier that I think is relevant. Power doesn't listen, uh, mm -hmm. for the most part. As you just said, uh, you know, before Mau Mau, so-called broke out, um, there were strikes, there were labor withdrawals, there were petitions, there were peaceful movements, and it was ignored, uh, you know, till things, you know, got difficult. Um, I hope that these movements will be listened to. I am not immediately optimistic that just petitioning uh, you know, the, the, the conservative government to have empire taught properly will happen, or that if it happens, uh, empire will be taught properly. There is a great deal of dishonesty uh, in this country around empire. Um, I do think, however, that uh, taking responsibility as young people uh, to demand that power concedes what you want, that to, to demand your rights, I think that is that is the way to go because actually there is no way around it. Uh, there is no way around persisting and there is no way around putting your foot down and demanding. Now, what steps you might take to escalate as happened in the case of the Colston statue, as Alia pointed out, uh, you know, uh, petitioning and asking and debating didn't actually work. It didn't even work in the case uh, of the Rhodes statue. And we have to see whether in fact, uh, what was decided a few days ago um, is in fact enacted. But I think that um, I can't give you a, a pat and simple answer. I think people are doing the right thing and making these demands and, and setting up these petitions uh, and movements. But I think we have to be prepared uh, to be in it for the long haul and to escalate as and when necessary to, to make sure that power listens. 100% agree. Thank you for bringing that up. This, this is, we're holding the bat on. This is, uh, this is the long run, but uh, yeah. the importance of infrastructure and movement building and solidarity in making sure that when these moments of inflammation come up, we're together and we're able to be united and safe because I think what a lot of people don't think in the 21st century, especially where we live in, is the surveillance, not only from the police, but of these groups who are fighting things. People have their houses raided. People are put in detention centers still. People lose their immigration status. And these are things that happen to activists in the UK who are even some of our friendship circles today. So that safety is a huge point and that the building of infrastructure to support when these inflammation periods come up is gonna be crucial in order for us to move forward. Um, we've got a, another comment from Annika, I think, who says, fill in the blanks is a campaign led by teenagers from South London to get British empire and slavery teaching. Um, mandatory at key stage three, history curriculum in the UK in the same way teaching the Holocaust is mandatory. Thank you for that. And we also have a comment um, from Vihan who says, honestly, Gandhi was extremely problematic. He didn't want to escalate calls for independence during World War II because he didn't want Indian freedom to come out of the British ruin, pathetic. And so that's some of the word on the street. Um, we also, I, I know we spoke a little bit earlier and you spoke with Imi as well around um, reading a little bit of the Roads Must Fall bit from your book, which feels very, very, um, not just urgent now, but very, like, very important to the current conversation. So as and when you're ready, my love. This is at the very end of the book after we have talked uh, about, uh, about the book has talked about, you know, the, the backstory of struggle and the ways in which, um, and this is uh, an important thing, the ways in which uh, 
those of us who are from minority communities in Britain, black and minority ethnic, um, we shouldn't be happy just to be included, right, or to be tolerated. We have to understand ourselves as agents in making this country, right, uh, and 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 contributing not just to its material reality, its money and its wealth, but also to its store of ideas. Mm-hmm. Um, so we think about ourselves as agents rather than as people who ought to be tolerated or allowed to sit at the table. So let me uh, read this bit then. Without an understanding of this backstory in which there is firstly British descent on the question of empire, which is secondly shaped by anti-colonial resistance, it becomes easy for present day apologists to caricature all critiques of the British imperial project as undertaken by quote, retrospective Jeremiah's denouncing the evils of a past colonialism. The patently false argument that criticism of empire involves judging the past by today's standards is given a free pass. We need to build an archive of dissidents, opposition, and criticism in relation to the British empire, one which might serve to caution us against leveling and self-serving assumptions about the past in order that we might engage in a more demanding way with the present. In the spring of 2016, controversy erupted over the demand by student campaigners at Oxford that a statue of the buccaneering colonial racist Cecil Rhodes be removed from the frontage of Oriel College, Oxford. The young activists were widely denounced by establishment historians and from other predictable quarters such as the Daily Mail and the Telegraph. They were accused by, among others, the eminent classical historian Mary Beard of wishing to whitewash history while still benefiting from its legacies. One of Beard's charges was that the Rhodes Must Fall campaigners were neglectful of history and that Rhodes was simply off his time. Mm -hmm. The idea not being propagated as it happens that he was a quote, particularly dreadful lone racist wolf in the late 19th century is completely barking, she declared. But was he so very completely endorsed in his time and by his peers? Here is another distinguished classicist writing in his memoirs about his return to Oxford where he had studied and taught for a number of years. I cannot say that I saw with pleasure my old university made a pedestal for the statue of such a man as Rhodes. Mm. The point is that not only was Rhodes widely despised by many people in his time, he was considered to be over the top, even by you know some imperial apologists, and famously, and this is where I'm shocked at uh, Oxford VC Richardson's comments along the same lines, Oxford dons refused to give Rhodes an honorary doctorate though the university wanted them to. So it's completely untrue that he was respected in his time. He bought himself a statue by giving money to the college. And Mm -hmm. here's another important thing. We're often told, well, you know, how dare you have Rhodes's money and uh, still criticize him. It's not Rhodes's money. Mm -hmm. This is money taken from the labor and resources of the black people of Southern Africa. Mm -hmm. So there is no question of talking about Edward Colston or Cecil Rhodes as philanthropists. You can't be philanthropic with other people's money. Mm-hmm. If anybody was philanthropic, it was the slaves whose labor made this money, as well as the people and the resources of Southern Africa. Thank you so much. I really wish it was just like a mic drop for that moment. That was incredible. Um, and such an urgent message in order for us to um, digest not only was Cecil Rhodes um, such a huge player in that but also Birmingham's native Joseph Chamberlain as colonial secretary who was often erased yeah. even having that caption um, all talking about his contribution towards the formation of apartheid um, and so I just wanted to thank you for sharing um, that particular thing and we have a comment from Tanya on something that you said a little bit earlier she says thank you for saying all of this Priya 
it is a painful reality that our own community in our own communities that we need to address perhaps it is something also to do with the language of communities in some way as it can be a means of sidestepping the very class as caste divisions that have been shaped both the decolonization process and the structural post-colonial state decolonization was slash is a space of such complex political contestation and um i just wanted to bring up on that point like the use of the term bame or bme because it's something that i've spoken extensively about but a load of other people are having conversations around now because of the new world that we're forging and moving into but the the use of the term and sometimes just like the nonsense of the fact that it is even formed as BAME um, of like black being a racialized identity that is global you can have black people in Asia you can have black people in China you can have black people all over and then Asia which is a consonant being the second word and the minority ethnic which also includes people who are racialized as white um, who are Polish and so on and so forth in this country um, and that when we really look at that term what are we looking to do and what what is the use of that term not as a term of solidarity but as a term of homogenization and of whole and of homogeneity and that when we start to look at those specifics not only do we start to look into the specificity of our communities and the cacao we come out of the mama rebellion as one of the black ethnic groups engaged in it but there is is the future one of specificity i think is my question and how do we start to untangle some of these through using a technique or um, the use of specificity as we move forward? So I guess I have, um, I don't have huge insights to offer here. I'll say two things. Sometimes collective identities can be useful. So when you mobilize against the state as minority groups, or when you mobilize as uh, people who are not racialized as white or racialized as not white, sometimes, there is common cause and common cause is always important. But I also think, as, as you just pointed out, um, it, it isn't always helpful to have a collective banner. There are times when collective banners are useful. And historically, for instance, political blackness uh, was used uh, or transnational blackness was used as a, as a mobilizing umbrella. But I do think that we live in times, uh, apropos Tanya's comment, where the language of communities, the language used by the state, uh, and which we then often uncritically reflect in our own language, uh, clearly has limitations. Because what it doesn't attend to is the power differentials between the different constitutive parts of that umbrella. Uh, it doesn't reckon, for instance, with Asian anti-Blackness. Mm -hmm. um, it doesn't uh, engage, as Tanya points out, uh, with very sharp divisions in Asian communities, not just around religion, not just around Hindu Muslim, for instance, but around caste. Um, you know, and and it, it has been very effective in allowing some of the most retrograde elements in Asian communities, uh, upper caste Hindus, for instance, uh, to lobby against uh, legislation which would have outlawed caste discrimination because they claim that to do so would be to hurt the feelings uh, of Hindus, right? So they're, they're using multiculturalism in a very selective, self-serving way. And this is why I said earlier that decolonization has to mean turning the critical lens upon ourselves as well, that we must be as attentive to power within communities as we are to white or colonial power wielded against communities. Mm -hmm. uh, so decolonization is a double responsibility uh, that we criticize the oppressor racialized as white, but that we also turn a critical lens upon ourselves. And that means that there are certain situations, uh, BLM being a, a good example, where we may all share the experience of racism, but we share it in very different ways. And Asians are not uh, necessarily subject in the same way to the violence that you know black people are. Uh, uh, you know, particularly, of course, in America, but also here. Mm -hmm. And within Asia, uh, Muslims are surveilled and targets of state violence in a way in which Hindus and Buddhists and Sikhs are not. Mm -hmm. um, and so we must be attentive. I'm, I'm in general in favor of articulating gen general umbrellas alongside specificities. I don't think the two need to be uh, opposed mm -hmm. to each other completely.
Thank you so much yeah. for making that point as well, because I think that's something that often gets sidelined, the fact that it's not binary. It can be and, and, and. It doesn't have to be either or in our use of analysis when thinking about these things. And just on the point of, um, what's it called, um, Muslim populations, as like a black Muslim, seeing some of that additional nuance and things that are added and like the racialization um of that religion also the erasure of a lot of like black historic um contributions to islam i think is something that is super, yeah. super um interesting but um in the uk if we are looking at that um the impact that that has since 9 11 um the muslim population in prisons has doubled like gone up 50 percent um, and again, another thing that is very urgent for us to look at or even just consider what the roots of those things are and then the relationship with the racialization and that multicultural rhetoric that we hear so often. Um, I did want to pick up on another point you brought up when we were talking about Cecil Rhodes being despised. And this will be like our last point before we jump out because we're jumping into another session afterwards. But um, quite often when we talk about empire, we talk about it in the UK, the West, um the western sphere of like the colonial period that happened with the uk being the root very like but barely do we talk about the fact that the uk colonized the states and that then those who had colonized the states then went on to colonize further it's almost like there's a detachment when we talk about empire and that formation of the states and how that manifests like what's going on today and I, I just saw a parallel between the way that um Rhodes was viewed and Lincoln so Lincoln during his time we just had Juneteenth the other day wasn't liked by a lot of people he was often the guy who told racist jokes so a lot of people were very confused when he said let's emancipate all these slaves and again it didn't come out of the kindness of his heart it came because of um, the economic damage that was being happened because of slave re enslaved people's rebellions. And so I just wanted to say, I'd like to see if you had any last comments on that relationship and that um, amnesia of mm -hmm. the racism we see in the US being a direct influence of the British Empire and um, yeah. what that means for um, Western relations today. Well, uh, thank you. Yeah, I mean, I think it's a particularly important question because when you will recall that when George Floyd's um, murder happened and then there were a lot of people who were saying, oh, my God, it's terrible what's happening in America. And it's a very standard white British response to say, oh, God, Americans are so racist. And of course, one thing I have to say as someone who lived in America and who has a large number of family in America is that I actually think that the discussion on race, partly because there are so many African-American leaders and organizers and intellectuals, is more advanced in the States than it is in Britain, Absolutely. believe it or not. Um, <laughs> secondly, I think that uh, you want to say to uh, uh, you know British, who are the white Americans we're talking about? It's not like they have no connection to you. Uh, they are the descendants of the European colonial project. Uh, particularly the British, uh, you know, what was known as the first British Empire. The other empires we've been talking about in Asia and Africa are known as the second uh, British Empire. I think it's incredibly important to talk about uh, these connections. And um, I will say that two things that America deals with and has to deal with um, have resonances for us today, which is that America is a land founded on two very important uh, what shall I say, forms of disenfranchisement. On the one hand, slavery. And let us not forget to this day, the native populations, the indigenous populations of America corralled as the Kenyans were into tiny little reservations mm. um, and, and deprived of their own land. And that is an ongoing colonization. It's, it's not in the past at all. So we have to you know, think about the indigenous peoples uh, of, of, uh, um, of the Americas. Um, but I think uh, the lesson that we draw from all of this is to say amnesia has to be undone. Mm. And while respecting the specificity of each context, we have to also learn about and understand the connections both between communities and within communities. Amazing. Um, on that note, thank you so much for joining us. Thank today. you. And um, if you have a picture, if you have the book, if you could just like, oh, yeah, can oh, yeah. share. and um, everyone go and buy the book, engage in more conversations about how like we ended the empire, not the um, colonizers. And um, yeah, just a big, big thank you. It's been an thank honor. Thank you.
Thanks. Thank you so much, Alia and Priya. What a like we need like two, three, four, five hours with this, right? But also Priya needs rest and uh to like you know eat ice cream and do things that normal <laughs> people do on a Sunday as well. Um okay, so two things I want to say here uh, that are quite personal. Number one, massive thank you. Um the labor it takes to do the work, to do the research, to put it together, to publish the book, and then to talk about it constantly and then get shit flung at you on Twitter every single day and to work within an institution that can be incredibly racist and difficult within its own people is next level right so you we have to support the people that do this work mm -hmm. not just today when you hear this not just when you buy the book and you tweet about it but like every day every few days when you see violence on Twitter and Facebook and in the media and in the Daily Mail and within the institution. So you have to show up, right? Like, so when you go and follow on Twitter and Facebook now and you go and buy the book or you recommend it or you borrow the book from the library or for, buy it from a wonderful independent, uh, you have to make sure that that support comes, right, all the time. Because I think there's this idea, like yesterday, um, uh, Manira talked about it in a different context, but this idea of like, everything has to stay young and then you know we we don't we don't like understand when this knowledge goes deeper and longer and people do this labor for years and years and years and the support people still need and i just like see priya as a hero but also see everything that happens like i really do and i and i don't think i have the patience and depth to do like the research and work to create this body of work but when people do, you need to appreciate that. And then equally, I want to say the same for our younger activists like Alia. So you have to show up, right? You have to keep showing up for each other. And I know because I'm watching on Twitter who's in this talk, that matters even more for allies. Because obviously our own community is going to show up for each other, right? But the allies that are in here, white allies, you got to keep doing this, right? After this festival and after you've pledged in these crowdfunders we've, su we've suggested, you have to keep like butting in and making sure that Priya or Alia don't have to bat off all the crap they get when they're on Newsnight or when the Daily Mail picks up on something or whatever. So I've just got to say that because I feel like what we're also cultivating here is a community of care and love and protection and supporting each other. Not protection against accountability, just like Priya said, protection against just pure hatred and abuse and violence. Mm. Um, so I want to- a quick one, can I say a quick one on that as well around allyship fatigue? Yeah. So it's been maybe like three weeks, four weeks, and a load of people who are white allies or those not racialized as black or brown are feeling tired. Um, I just want to pose a question. Can you imagine this being your whole life and not just three weeks? Um, and what that level of fatigue might be. And then if we move from that point of view, maybe we'll see a little bit more change and a little bit less self-centering within these narratives. And let me just jump in and say, I think the great thing is that we, we all remember to be there for each other. You know, I mean, we are a, a, a good critical community and we give each other kind of love and support. And I think that's what's immensely wonderful. Thank you so much. Lots of love. Bye.